Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. We have come now all the way from Genesis to the book of Revelation, and uh, we're leaving breadcrumbs at each chapter. <laughs> Because one of my mentors said he's seen pastors wade off into the book of Revelation and never come back. Mm -hmm. So we're just tying a string to our toe. We're marking <laughs> these chapters, you know, so we, if we need to retrace our steps, we'll be able to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you, you, you laugh, but I think you might, uh, <laughs> after today's study, you're going to hear some things in Revelation chapter 4 that... Uh, you may not have heard, not because they're obscure, uh, but because it's a level of prophetic perspective on the book of Revelation that uh, is so powerful. Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 4, the throne revealed. In Revelation 4, John is caught up to the throne to experience that heavenly atmosphere. And he sees the throne and he sees the one sitting thereon. He sees four living creatures and 24 mm -hmm. elders. And all of these represent many things that people have expanded on over the centuries but they also represent, and that which we're going to inquire into today, they represent something of who God is and who God is in you. Amen. So let's begin, Kitty, if you would read uh, the entire chapter, Revelations <coughs> chapter 4. I will. Here we go. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking to me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat on the throne, he that sat, was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto a crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts, full of eyes, before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast, beast had a face as a man, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Hallelujah. And when these beasts, um, those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever. And cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they were created. So in Revelations chapter 1, Jesus presents himself to John and commands him to write down what he's about to experience. In chapters 2 and 3, Jesus gives seven messages to the seven angels. And that's not literal angels like we think of, but the word there means messenger. 
and we spoke at length about that in our study of chapter 2 and chapter 3. Now, this vision John is experiencing comes to a scene of the throne room. He looks initially and he sees a doorway standing open. And you have to begin to, what I, I would say, turn on your revelator. In other words, begin to think about the metaphors because God told Aaron and Miriam that when he would speak through a prophet, it would be in dark speech. And that word dark speech, it's literally the word riddles. So it's representative language. And what it represents is very specific. We have metaphors throughout the scripture that are consistent one with another. So if we see, for instance, a door in this passage, we can go look at other passages about the door prophetically. And one of my, uh, I had an assistant pastor in my the second church that I pastored in my lifetime. And he taught very simply. He said, you have to let scripture interpret scripture. And he consistently approached the Word of God like that and came up with some profound understandings that just seemed so evident because it was allowing the Scripture to interpret the Scripture. So John sees a doorway standing open in the heavens. Now, it's easy to keep reading. Yes, it's a door. Well, let's go through the door. Well, hold on just a minute. Let's see, beyond, before we see what happens next, let's ask ourselves, what does this door represent? Mm -hmm. This part of the vision could have been presented in a myriad of ways. For instance, Jacob. Jacob didn't see a door. He saw a ladder and saw God standing at the top of the ladder. But the Father chose at this point in showing John these things, and showing him the throne to represent the access John has been given to this realm as a door. He could have given a ladder. He could have done other things, but he didn't do it. Uh, he could have shown these things also the perspective, and we'll get to this, uh, we'll cover this differently in just a moment. The perspective is not John standing on the earth looking up. By the time he gets to this point, he is standing in a direct line of sight to the things that he's shown. That's very, very important. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. Now, the door. In the Gospel of John, this very writer recorded the words of Jesus as follows. John 10, 7. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily. In other words, this is really important. I want you to think about this. I am the door of the sheep. So Jesus is the door to us by which we enter into relationship with the Father. Now, what do you do with a door? A door gives you access to what lies beyond it. Paul uses this very language describing redemption in Christ. Think about it. A door, it's an access way. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2.18 says, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. And, and who is it on the throne? It's the Father on the throne. John is being given access by Jesus mm -hmm. to the Father on the throne. So, who is the door? The door is Jesus. Now, let me ask you a question. Where is Jesus? <laughs> well, he's on a planet called heaven. Is he now? Well, he's in some sci-fi dimension, some otherly realm. Is he now? <laughs> I, I won't argue with any of that, but, but is it not also true 
that he lives on the inside of you. He lives in our hearts by faith. So he is the door, and we're entering into something, and he is the door, not only that we go through, but he is the door that is in us. Amen. Because he lives in our hearts. I submit to you, as the first verse of Revelation declares, that in showing John a door, he was showing him something more than just the beginning of a revelation of God's linear purpose through time. You know, the Clarence Larkin chart, beginning in eternity past, and going through the epochs of time to eternity future. He's doing so much more than that. We tend to see Revelation exclusively as a roadmap of future apocalyptic events. Now, let's go back to when the Pharisees asked Jesus questions like this. And he changed the narrative to something much more personal. Luke chapter 17, verse 20. And when Jesus was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, God's linear purpose through time, see, what are they doing? Time-bound thinking. Do you understand that time consciousness is a product of the fall? Because before the fall, man did not have a sense of time because he was an eternal creature. He was not immortal. One day we will put on immortality. He was eternal because he could die. And ultimately he did die because of transgression. So the Pharisees are saying, when's the kingdom of God going to come? In other words, God, I don't want you to represent yourself as you choose to represent yourself. I need you to think like I do and let these things make sense. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, and notice what he said, it doesn't come with observation. That's why people study the book of Revelation and come up with so many wrong ideas because they're trying to discern a visual representation through these chapters of God's linear purpose through time, and it's the very way Jesus said, sorry, fellas, not only are you not asking the right questions, not only are you not coming up with the right answers, you're not asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Verse 21, neither shall they say, lo, here. If you understand something about location, the theory of relativity as articulated by Einstein, says that time and distance are a component, constituent parts of a whole. In other words, time and space, this three-dimensional world we live in, are inherently a part, one of another. So when Jesus says, lo, here, that means not, he's not, it's not in this time, or in the time to come, or in some planet called heaven, they're going to say low here, low there. Why? Because that, that environment initially created for Adam to take dominion over was contaminated by sin. And God's not going to function in that realm. He refuses to. So it's not low here or low there. And then Jesus says, for behold, the kingdom of God is on a planet called heaven. It's in a 6,000-year time frame and blah, blah, blah. Is it now? No, he says the kingdom of God is within you. Mm -hmm. Whatever Jesus held to be the kingdom of God, he saw it as something holy on the inside of you. Now, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but who was he talking to? Mm -hmm. We say, yes, the kingdom of God is within you because you're a good evangelical. You signed a decision card. You got baptized in the Holy Ghost. You go to church. Sunday morning, Sunday night, not anymore. Wednesday night prayer meeting, when you didn't pray, and so we don't do that anymore. But you're a good little evangelical Christian that professes a new birth, so the kingdom is in you. He was talking to men who were about to crucify him. So he's looking at things from a perspective very different than what we do. These men wanted an understanding of Jesus' thoughts on eschatology, which is a study of the end times. But Jesus responds again. They aren't asking the right question. The kingdom they were seeking to understand was not to be revealed 
not only in some epoch, epic unfolding of future events, but in realizing as well, so I'm speaking truth by emphasis and not by exclusion. Are you listening? Realizing that as well, the kingdom that yes, surely will come in a future unfolding is also something on the inside of us. Yeah. An entirely different proposition. You can look here and you can find the scroll mm -hmm. of what God, what Jesus told John. And we're going to get into that some today. So John sees the door, and immediately he's in the spirit and sees a vision of the throne of God. Now let me ask you a question. Does Jesus sit on the throne of your heart? Does Jesus sit? The scripture says, Ephesians 3, 17. People argue with this. No, he's in the host in the local Catholic church. He's in that wafer that they hand out. Or you go to church and they say, shh, this is the house of God. Is it now? God told me if you want to find the house of the idol in your community, think about everywhere in your community where people are expected to whisper. Hospitals, libraries, banks, and churches. Those are the houses of the idol in our culture. But Paul said in Ephesians 3.17, that Christ may dwell in, that word means inhabit, dwell in your heart by faith that you might be rooted and grounded in love. Now, from that perspective, what John sees in this vision is something of the kingdom that Jesus declared to the Pharisees in Luke 17. It's on the inside of you. John not only sees a throne, but he sees one who sits on the throne, and I really like that. He do, he's not quite sure what he's seeing. <laughs> He doesn't say, I saw God sitting on the throne. No, he said, I saw one sitting on the throne. And he, he no doubt knew who it was, but he's moving with great respectfulness. Mm -hmm. This is such this other, an otherly sight that John doesn't immediately, or let's say presumptively identify him. Instead, he gives us a description. Now, the person sitting on the throne, he says, was likened to a jasper and a sardine stone or carnelian. Now, that's very interesting. Because he's, imagine looking at a person like you're looking at me, and that person is luminescent, <coughs> like a living gemstone, mm -hmm. both of jasper mm -hmm. and of sardine. All the ladies said, boy, I like this party. Yeah, Steve. verily. Jewelry. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. <laughs> jasper. What is jasper? Jasper was the stone on the high priest's breastplate. One day we're going to do a teaching on the 12 stones on the breastplate of the high priest. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what are stones formed of? Jewels are formed of heat and pressure. Malachi said there will be a day that God's going to make up his jewels. Yes, oh God, let me enter into that. Well, you're asking God to bring you into an experience of heat and pressure. <laughs> and when you're under heat and pressure, what's in there is going to come out. It's like the tent preacher that was working for my dad around the backside of a house, painting a house. And my dad walked around and that tent evangelist that had preached to thousands was back there having a cussing fit. And he he came down that ladder. He said, oh, Brother Roy, uh, I, I, that's not me. I don't talk like that. His name was Red. Dad looked at him and he said, Red, if it wasn't in there, it wouldn't come out. <laughs> <laughs> now, Jasper stood. He looked like Jasper. It's interesting. It, it was, by all accounts, a green emerald-like stone mm -hmm. and a red stone. Carnelian comes from the word, Greek word carne that says sardine, but it's known in history to be the equivalent of the carnelian stone. And so it stood for the tribe of Benjamin, which is at the 10th position on the breastplate. Sardine or carnelian, now that was jasper at and then sardine, or the carnelian, was this blood red stone that stood in the third position representing the tribe 
of Reuben, who was originally God's first choice. You think God is going to forget you if you blow it? Here, Reuben slept with his father's concubine. He defiled himself. He lost the birthright, but yet God himself, in appearance, he resembled that which he established himself to represent the failed destiny of Reuben. The carnelian is also called the warrior stone. And it speaks of courage because at the time that John wrote this, all warriors would carry carnelian stones into battle around their neck because they believed it gave them courage and strength. Verse 4 reveals that there were 24 seats around the throne. It's interesting. God was on a throne, and they were in 24 seats, not thrones. And uh, on these seats sat 24 elders, clothed in simple white raiment. God himself is sitting on the throne. He looks like a living gemstone of jasper and carnelian. But these elders, and they had white garments and crowns on their heads. Now, these elders are not identified, but the early fathers, now that's the third generation of leaders from the apostles. The apostles, then the apostolic fathers, were the leaders that the apostles trained to take their place when they were gone. And then the apostolic fathers trained the next generation of leaders that are referred to as the early fathers. The early fathers believed that th these 24 elders were the 12 founding apostles of the first century and that the remaining 12, adding up to 24, were 12 finishing apostles mm -hmm. that would be raised up at the culmination of the church age. Mm -hmm. And if you look in Revelation chapter 12, which we're going to be soon, uh, you'll see that bears out because the sun clothed church has 12 stars on her head and under her feet. So now something else to note about the 24 elders. Jesus sits enthroned on your heart. So the vision of the throne not only speaks of heavenly things, but represents as well what John is seeing. It represents the human heart indwelled by Christ. Remember verse 1 of Revelation 1, it's an unveiling and apocalypsis of the Christ. It doesn't say it's an apocalypsis of end time events. It reveals those things, but more importantly, what it should first be speaking to us about who Jesus is, and if it's going to talk about who Jesus is, it's who he is in us because he sits in throne in our heart. Now, so what does that have to do with 24 elders? So here, your heart is a throne that Jesus sits on. There are 24 elders around the throne. And guess what? You have 24 ribs surrounding your physical heart. 24 ribs encasing the human heart. 24 elders around the throne. And Jesus sits enthroned on your heart. White clothing, that means your righteousness is in you. Mm -hmm. You are wrapped in righteousness. Glory. The white clothing speaks of the righteousness of the believer. We are righteous not because of who we are or what we've done, but because of who Jesus is and what he did for us. We are righteous. We're clothed in the simplicity of the righteousness afforded us in Christ. The crowns denote the believer's standing as both a king and a priest. And what's coming out of the throne? Flashes of lightning, thunderings, and voices. Now, when the voice of God speaks to you, he will speak out of your heart his habitation by the Spirit. What are the bolts of lightning? The bolts of lightning and thunderings are heaven's response to faith-filled prayers coming out of you. Because you got to understand, if he answers from the throne and the throne is on the inside of you, then the answer is coming out of you. He said in Philippians 4.19, he would meet all your need according to his riches and glory, and the glory is in you. Paul said the, the heart of his gospel was Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he said further that God meets all of your needs out of the glory. So in you, in embryo, 
is the meeting of every possible need you could conceivably have, and it comes forth out of you in thunderings, lightnings, hail, as Revelation 8, 3 through 5 reveals. Are you listening? John also sees seven lamps that represent the seven spirits of God enumerated in Isaiah 11, 1 through 3. They are the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. You have all that running around on the inside of you. All these things are in you by the indwelling of the Spirit of God breathed, breathed into you at new birth and enlarged to capacity in you by the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In verse 6, John sees the floor of the throne. This is very important for you to understand. He sees the floor of the throne in appearance as a sea of glass. In other words, it's a transparent floor. Uh, some have suggested this is made of gold so pure that it's transparent. This sea of glass is the same thing Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel 122 that he called the terrible crystal. <laughs> if you compare Ezekiel's vision, now watch. If you compare Ezekiel's vision and John's, you will see that Ezekiel did not stand on this glass, but he was on the earth looking up through that glass, that transparent floor, at the throne. John, on the other hand, is not looking up through. He's standing on the sea of glass. Remember what the scripture talks about? Uh, beholding your face as in a glass. Mm -hmm. What that glass, the Bible talks about your conscience being defiled. And because your conscience is defiled, you can't see God. That glass represents your conscience, your conscience. If you could look on the inside of you, your human spirit is made up of your conscience, your intuition, and your uh, sense of God consciousness. There's, there's another word for it, but we'll use that one. And so when... Jesus sprinkles your conscience and you know you're righteous not because of who you are, what you've done, but because of who Jesus is and what he has done. Mm -hmm. Suddenly that which has been obscure is now crystal clear. Mm -hmm. And not only do you see, you walk in and uh, in and out, Jesus said in John, uh, and find pasture. Mm -hmm. So John is given access to a realm in God, John is standing on what the Old Testament believer, Ezekiel, was looking up through. He couldn't access it. So John is standing as a believer, and you and I with him, with access to a realm that the Old Testament believer could not enter because the way, who is Christ, was not yet made, made clear or provided. This is why Jesus said that the least in the kingdom of God is greater than any Old Testament saint because of the provisions of Calvary. Mm -hmm. Standing around the throne within the circle of the 24 elders are the four living creatures, full of eyes, before and behind. The human heart has four chambers. Mm -hmm. The four beasts, what are they doing? They're crying out, holy Holy, holy, echoing the heart cry of the believer, enunciating praise and worship to God without ceasing with every beat of their hearts. The beasts have four faces, being that of a lion, and I'm listing them in order, a lion, a calf, a man, and a flying eagle. Now, if you understand what these faces are looking at, you will understand their meaning. Why does he mention the lion first? Because that's the one, he's on the other side of the throne, that's the first one looking at him. The face of the lion is looking directly at John, and John is looking to the north because the scripture says God dwells in the north. So the face of the lion is looking directly at John, and by extrapolation, the earth below and beyond the door. The lion is looking, John's not there all the time, the lion is 
uh, of those creatures' faces looking through that door out into the realm that John has just come from. The lion speaks of rule. When we look upon the earth from our position in Christ, it's from the position of being seated and ruling and reigning as kings and priests of in the earth. He says, as he is, so are we in the earth. How is he? He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Hallelujah. What about the calf? The calf looks to the east. And the east is the direction that the Messiah, we've seen the eastern gate, that the Messiah comes from. The calf is a creature born for sacrifice. And he also represents service. So we believe that Christ is coming. And we greet him as what? As a lion? No. As a man? No. We greet as an eagle? No. We greet him as the calf. Jesus is coming, and I want to be that living sacrifice that he calls for. Mm -hmm. And I want to have my life poured out in service to him. Amen. The face of the man would have been behind the creature, from John's perspective, he saw the line behind that in the back would have been the face of the man. And the face of the man is that which looks directly at God's throne. When we stand before God, it's without any pretense in any way. We come to him in vulnerability, humility, giving honor to him. Why the face of a man? Because that's what he made man in order that he might see. We are reflecting back to him the image that we are created to represent. Mm -hmm. We are presenting back to him. Here I am, Father, in your image. And the Father says, mm -hmm. yes, here is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. Mm -hmm. The eagle looks to the west. What does that represent? Now remember, in Jerusalem, to the west is what? It's the ocean. West, and it's also where the sun sets. West is a direction that in ancient times they believed when the sun went down, it was setting in the realm of the dead. It was setting in a realm of darkness. Mm -hmm. It represents darkness, evil, the sea of lost humanity. Uh, the very words used for West in the Bible mean sea, mean evil, mean darkness. You look those words up and do an etymology on them. So looking to the west is the eagle. We're facing the domain of darkness as the eagle mounting up on high. What is the eagle's response when it's moving? To mount up. That when the enemy comes along, Watchman Nee in his book, The Spiritual Man, said the greatest danger for the believer is being passive. And let me tell you something, an eagle is not a symbol of passivity. Mm -hmm. He's mounting up over every challenge that he faces. And not only that, but he discerns. He has discernment. He looks and he sees mm -hmm. with an acuity of sight more powerful than almost any other creature. So all of these personas, the eagle, the lion, the man, the calf, they are in us. In Christ, just as the seven attributes of the Spirit of God are in us, empowering us and molding us into the image of God. Mm -hmm. Oh, where are you getting all this, Brother Walden? <laughs> Think about the six wings. The six wings of the creatures affirm to us that they represent something of ourselves because six is the number of man. And these wings are... And the number six is also, when you read the Bible, it says God created the heavens and the earth. That word and is the Hebrew number six. And Jesus always called himself the son of man. He was saying, I am the number six. And the symbol for six, when you would write six in or vav, V-A-V -V, mm -hmm. in Hebrew, it, you would write a symbol that looked like a tent stake, the heavens and the earth. They believed that the heavens were, a, uh, what do they call that, a hookah mm -hmm. over the earth, and that 
the number six is the tent stake. It's the point where heaven and earth come together. That's who God created man to be. And these wings are full of eyes, suggesting that what we see in the spirit, we can have access to and can move toward or above. See, we ambulate. Do you understand? Wings help us ambulate in the pneuma. If we're walking, like if you dream you're riding a bicycle, that's doing something in the flesh. If you dream you're flying with eagle's wings, that's ambulating in the pneuma or in the spirit. But understand this, he, what he's saying by putting eyes in those wings is that everywhere God puts a window or a vision, he puts a door of access. If you can see it, you can walk in it. That's why it is through the foolishness of preaching. How shall they hear unless they somebody preaches? And the preacher uh, portrays what God is saying. And when you see it, some people say, oh, I just can't see that. Okay. You're dismissed. Here's your hall pass. Uh, go down to the lunchroom and wait till class is over. But if you could say, I can see it, the eyes on, you understand, the eyes on your wings are opening up. And what you see, you can enter into. Now, these four creatures are not silent. They're crying, holy, holy, holy. And when they do, the 24 elders fall on their faces casting their crowns at the feet of the one on the throne, declaring his worthiness, his sovereignty, and his power. And all of this speaks of the God who was, who is, and who is to come. The entire vision declares to us the majesty of God, established in, the un, in, in unending eternity past, and also the God who is in us at this very moment, and the God who will reveal himself to be in the unfolding future. It is also who he is in us. Jesus mm -hmm. said, if you want to understand the kingdom, don't, when they say, look here in time, or that's why dispensationalism is a way to organize your thoughts about God's purposes, but it is, cannot be codified or canonized as uh, the only way to look at what God's doing. He's, he was, he is, he is to come. And we're walking out God's linear purpose through time by not looking at the map, but by looking at him. What a powerful, powerful Amen. understanding that gives to us. And it helps us to know the Christ in us better than we ever did before. And the example of the ribs and the four chambers and the, the 24 elders, it just so enlightens you and you... It's like you, okay, I got a picture now and I'm carrying the picture and it's on the inside of you. We always have, we know Christ in us, but that sure helps to bring it home, so to speak. Glory. When we, when God first showed that to me, I was uh, with a group of friends out in the country in a little 14 by 8 trailer uh, in Missouri and uh, it was all guys and our host was making um, uh, what was it? It was pancakes out of wheat flour. I mean, it was not, not like refined wheat. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was really hearty. <laughs> and so we called them uh, uh, elder cakes because we're going to eat those. They're going to stick to our ribs. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what's on the inside of you, my brother and my sister. Amen. And we're not done talking about it because we're going to see when we get to Revelations 8, it's going to give you an understanding of how you deal with your fellow man, how you deal with people in your immediate circle. Yeah. Because let me tell you something. When you're dealing with the enemy, you're moving in the uh, modality of the eagle. When you're dealing with God, you don't come to God like an eagle. You come to God like a man. Yeah. And you come to one another because we're supposed to love one another mm -hmm. as God loves us. Mm -hmm. So when you deal with people in your immediate circle, you deal with them eye to eye as a man. You, how many people do I know? Poor, poor Christian ladies married to a screaming eagle. I mean, they're in their home and they're just being this, this eagle in these things or 
they're walking around as a calf. And they're being a calf to people that are taking advantage of them and they don't know how to say no. Mm -hmm. But we are not a calf to men. Mm -hmm. We are a calf to Christ and the unfolding purposes of Christ. Mm -hmm. Are you listening? Mm -hmm. So the eagle, the man, the lion, and the calf. Mm -hmm. All of these have to do with how you deal with circumstances and situations around you. And like you can't be like, remember that old gospel song, I'm only human. That's wrong thinking. That's wrong. You don't, you don't go onto a spiritual battlefield thinking oh, that, oh, I'm just, I'm just flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. No, you're not. When you're on the battlefield, you are moving in the authority of the eagle, the authority of the lion. God's given you jurisdiction in your life. You're not walking around as a mere man. John Lake understood that when he wrote a, a message about spiritual hunger and the God myth. You are a God carrier. And when you're out there moving around your jurisdiction, you better be acting like it or the enemy's going to bulldoze you. Are you listening? So, Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you. We thank you for this apocalypsis of the Christ in us. We thank you that this is something of who you are running around in us and manifest in us. We thank you. We acknowledge you, Father, for the wonder of your word in our lives today. God bless you.